Thank you to Fire Buyers Guide Live for the opportunity to speak today. Um, today I get to talk about technical rescue search cameras and their evolution. Uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, to talk about something that I've been doing for the last 15 years. So I will endeavor to be brief. Okay, so uh, why cameras at all, right? So the most uh, highest profile example of cameras in a rescue scenario is a structural collapse building. Uh, they can um, come down from natural disasters, terrorism, all kinds of different things can happen to make this building come down. And it's up to the rescuer's job to go through that building and find any potential live victims. So there's several different types of collapses that the, um, the rescuers will look at to determine where might the void spaces be, right? So over time, as they started doing this, uh, they found that the need to get a camera inside those void spaces was really quite important to them. And uh, also to be able to recover deceased individuals as well, to give them the, the respect that they deserve and to be able to demolish the site further and clear it. So they developed um, uh, the, this idea that they needed to look into those void spaces is very important. They started to design teams that were sole function was to do technical search, and they started to deploy things like canines. So cameras was a natural type of evolution to go along with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, this type of scenario. So let me uh, let me go all the way back to the beginning. So I'm certain uh, before the first technical rescue camera was created that uh, teams were trying to deploy things like bore scopes and industrial um, uh, cameras that were used for, you know, inspection services, even commercial and, and uh, you know, consumer level cameras, but they all kind of didn't fit the, the scope that they needed to do. Uh, one of the biggest things is they didn't have a speaker and a microphone in the camera had to have a two way conversation with the victim. So back in 1995, there was a fellow, Scott Park, he was a firefighter. I'm not sure what his rank was when he designed the camera, uh, but he designed a camera for his team. And then uh, ultimately he designed it for the rest of the world. And it came out to be the Search Cam 1000, which is on the left of your screen. You see, it was a, by no means a small device. You had a backpack, you had a front pack with a CRT screen. I mean, 1995 guys. So, and then uh, the the camera itself was on a pole with an articulating camera head. The one on the right is the Search Cam 2000 that came quickly afterwards when a lot of feedback from the users kind of came back and said, you know, it's too cumbersome with all the packs. But clearly, this again articulating camera head on a pole with a video display type screen. Right. So over time, um, this evolved uh, into having uh, different types of cameras based on the same kind of idea. You have a articulating camera head connected by a wire back to some type of video display unit. Generally, all those video display units were built by the company who made the camera. So on the left is, is the Hasty camera by uh, Savox, and then on the right, uh, it's the, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's uh, another camera designed by another company, but the same premise was always there. And then they also developed like cameras that are on cable probes, so you could actually lower the camera down like 300 feet, and you could have cameras on super long probes, but they were basically all around the same concept, um, which was articulating camera head, cable to a video display. Now, as they started developing and using these cameras, they started creating more tactics and how to use them better. So what we found is that they designed um, like core drill bits to make sure that you had actually access to the void space with the camera head. So you get like a nice two, two and a quarter inch hole to be able to put the camera head through. The other thing was is, and until you've actually used a camera in a rescue scenario, once you lose sight of the camera head itself, you kind of lose contact with where you are looking. Um, it's hard to describe, but it's basically, you're kind of blind. So you have to put the camera in. So they designed this system, which is based on the clock, right? So you have your hole, you put the camera in, and then you start looking from nine o'clock to three o'clock, rotate, 
two o'clock to eight o'clock, rotate one o'clock to seven o'clock. You get the idea. So you start rotating the camera and then the camera would go back and forth and you would look inside the space to make sure you covered the entirety, all right? So this is sort of the idea. And then you'd use uh, props inside like chairs or uh, wall sockets to give you an idea of size, right? So the, this whole concept around tactics was, how do I get to see inside the space and maintain my bearings? So some of the developments that came along, I'm using a lot of search can because I was involved with that company at one time. And um, on screen here, you'll see that they actually have an indicator showing you that the camera is so many degrees to the right, right? And then you'll see on there that you've got the lights turned on, that you've got the microphone is muted, uh, that you've got the audio on so you can hear. A lot of times, once you get that camera into that void space, you can hear a whole lot more than you can outside of it, right? So it's really important that you deploy um, ears into the space as well as your eyes. And then this uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see some of the controls that are on the, uh, the pistol grip, you know, to be able to rotate the camera head, turn on and off the lights, um, you know, turn on up and down the speaker and things of that nature, right? So those are some of the tactics and things that started to develop to make these cameras useful in the space. And some, some teams went so far as to make them, you know, waterproof underwater cameras and all those different kind of things. So the cameras were really coming along. The screen started to get brighter. You had contrast controls on them. You had the ability to maybe detach them and maybe slightly longer cord, those kinds of things, right? But something was needed. Something needed to come along that sort of takes that, that basic design, which has been around since 1995 and copied by uh, companies throughout the world. And I'm not slamming that because that's the only technology that was available at that time. That's the only way you could build a camera of that kind, right? The, the idea that wireless and uh, small camera heads and lighting was, you know, constantly developing. So now, now that we've got to a certain point where we can, um, utilize miniaturization of Wi-Fi components. Um, uh, the camera lenses have gotten to be so very good in the, um, in the realm of small sizes and ruggedized as well, that we can look at something new. So the evolution of the camera now has gone to a point where we're getting rid of the articulating camera head. And I'll go into some reasons why a little bit later, but essentially the biggest one is there's a lot of moving pieces in that. And if it gets broken, the camera's completely out of service, right? That's the biggest thing. So how do we, how do we get away from a rotating camera head and still give a quality image to our rescue customers? Uh, so essentially what took place is the design to camera that actually, and this is a little slightly better picture here on this side, you have a, a camera on one side of the camera of the uh, housing and another camera on the other side. So you basically have two cameras. They're fisheye lenses, so 180 degrees. They're installed on the camera on opposite sides. So now you have the two cameras picking up information wirelessly or wired. We still have wired back to a video display. And that is actually an Android device. It's basically a mini computer. Right, And that mini computer then can take that information and stitch the two images together, giving you one complete image. Right, So as I go back to this image here, I want you to sort of think about an articulating camera head is kind of like having a flashlight in a very dark room. So wherever you point that flashlight, you get to see what's in that room, but nothing else. It's a, it's a point. Right. Whereas with the spherical 360 spherical rescue design, it's like turning on the lights in the room. You get to see the entire room at one time with the scroll of your finger, but it's very quick. So you can do a quick scope about exactly what's there. And then now you do a very detailed search. Right. So flashlight versus flicking on the lights. It's probably the easiest way to sort of think about that leap in technology. And of course, incorporating an Android tablet and uh, soon to be um, iOS is the ability now that you have a computer in your hand. So once you take your recording, you can do instant playback. 
You take a picture, you can instantly send that picture to somebody else, right? Uh, on a Wi-Fi network, or if you put in the SIM card, right? So there's um, a lot of advantages to that and they're constantly getting better, right? So, and ruggedized as well. So now you can get what a, a tablet of choice in a sense, uh, rather than having stuck with a manufacturer specific LCD display, right? Um, lots of different ways to accessorize it now. So the camera itself, you see it hanging here on a rope and on a cable. So for, you can detach it from that pole now. So it's no longer tied to that pole. So you can attach it, click it on, and now do high angle rescues with this device or lower it into pits and things of that nature to have a look inside. So I think that's a, a critical thing getting away from that boom. So what is developed with this type of technology is the ability to do a search in pairs as opposed to having the tablet or having the video display on the pole and then one person trying to negotiate the hole and look at the screen at the same time. Right. So by having them separated from each other, and you can do this wired version as well if you get optional longer cables, but wirelessly now you can have one individual who is just focused, purely focused on putting the camera into successful void spaces, things that they've looked at, you know, the pancake versus the W, all of those things, they've determined a void space. That person is responsible for getting the camera inside the void space and nothing else. So they can keep their eyes on the rubble pile, make sure they're standing steadfast. The other person is the operator of the tablet can now basically sit back, uh, get a, a firm seat, safety, right? And then now view that screen and giving direction to the other individual. That person can now actually take a coat and put it over themselves to cover out the sun or the snow or the rain to give them a better chance at communicating with that tablet. We even have like gloves or there's gloves available that have a haptic touch. So if the screen gets wet, no problem, you can wipe it down, but you can wear gloves, safety, 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 right? And use the tablet. Testing with this, the method from going from a single person to a dual person, um, and it was very small testing. I'd love to hear more from people, but it sped up the, the actual search so much, and they were able to detect the live um, victims. In this case, it was simulated, but much quicker than a single person by themselves. So not only do you get safety, but you get actually a faster response. And it's all about speed when it comes to live victim retrieval, right? Plus the media is always there watching. So you wanna look good. All right, so expanded functionality. So as we go along uh, on screen now, and I'll, I'll do a quick little demonstration of um, how this actually functions here in a moment with the video, but the on-screen presence with using a tablet is so much more enhanced because you have a, a, the power of the Android tablet itself to write code, very good code. And the interesting thing is the camera hardware remain the same for years potentially, but the software can always be improved, updated with functionality, with things that people want to do with it. So in this case, you have a much bigger display. And we, you know, kits that come with like 10 inch or eight inch tablets and uh, on screen. So I'm just going to click to the next one. Hopefully I get this right. It's got a little video on here and I'm just going to play this video for you. I just want to show you a quick recording of what it looks, looks like to, through the lens of a fisheye type 360 spherical camera. So I'm just going to pause this video here. So this was recorded um, using the FL360 to the Android tablet. Now with my finger, I can control this tablet, right? So I can control the image just like you would live stream. The circle you see in front of you is always the front of the camera. As I rotate right, you'll see the field of indicator up in the top turn right with me and also the green lines indicating this is the right camera. As I keep going, I'll get to the X, which is always the back of the camera. And we can clearly see uh, the point of entry into this void space. And then as I continue along, it goes red to indicate the left camera. There we go. At any point, I can tap the field of view indicator and bring myself dead center to start again. Now, in a live stream, you won't see the play and share button and, and a picture capture button, but you'll get the idea of how this actually operates. So let me just let this run 
all the way through the detail is excellent as it's running you can actually send see the operators at the top of the site and clear detail and that's sort of what you get with a um, 360 spherical imaging camera so essentially what we're looking at here is the the sort of evolution of the camera becoming a lot more user friendly a lot more information being gathered at the one time and information is power you can make better decisions based on the information you get uh, there will be some advances coming out uh, even for those individuals who purchased through this camera three years ago that allows them to do multiple streaming uh, to go to ios which is coming so there's lots of improvements that can be done in a software level that doesn't require massive hardware changes now the evolution of this type of camera takes us a little bit step further um, in the fact that we're moving beyond just using it for technical search. Uh, already, a lot of teams uh, use it, uh, give the camera to their recovery team, the team that, you know, once you find somebody, you get on the radio, say we got a live one, the rest, the search guys move on, and then the extraction team shows up, as well as the medics to actually uh, stabilize potentially that victim and give them the care that they need. So that's been evolving in a USAR urban search and rescue type scenario. But on a heavy truck rescue, we're seeing teams now deploy the camera because it's the articulating camera head's gone. It's, it's so much easier now to slide the camera underneath a, a wreck of a vehicle that you want to lift with your airbags to make sure there's no sharp objects where you put the airbags in. So do a little look first. Okay, I'll put the airbags here, here, and here. Do the lift and not worry now that your airbags could be damaged or punctured under extreme load, which is very dangerous, obviously. Um, you think about the big rig accident. If the driver is trapped inside the vehicle, you can now get that camera. All you need is one of the lenses into the space where his feet are to see if his legs are trapped in the uh in the rig or if is there blood so upper body there's no blood lower body there's blood oh that just means that my rescue now has to speed up right information information is important so using a camera now in industrial accidents in trench in high angle as i showed you earlier you could drop it down with you know how hard it is at a high angle to get an articulating camera to point the right direction it's almost impossible but with a spherical camera it's a no brainer. The cameras are always ready and always in position, no matter what position they're actually in. So it's it's quite it's quite remarkable. So anyway, we're 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 open to discussing uh, things with to do with the camera outside of search. So that's part of the evolution. So not only have we improved the technology as the years went by, but we've also improved the test case, the use case for a technical search camera. So now it's not just search, it's a technical rescue camera. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody uh, today uh, for sitting through my presentation. I did manage to squeeze it into less than 20 minutes. Uh, pretty proud of myself. There's my contact information. I'd be happy to discuss in full detail. I have a complete video suite in my home to do demonstrations, as does my international sales counterpart, Matt Fittis. Uh, we do sales around the world. Um, and this camera now is in 22 countries, uh, soon to be more. So pretty excited about where this is going. I'm sure that there will be uh, evolutions from other manufacturers to take this whole camera into new spaces, into new things to help uh you individuals who do the rescues around the world to do your jobs thank you very much uh, most appreciated and have yourself a great day